So we'll go ahead and, and collect a, uh, a few questions now. Uh, yeah, Eric, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Mike's coming, so be patient. Um, I, I have two uh, questions, cum uh, comments. The, uh, the first one for uh, uh, Alain, um, and just to give you a little background, I was raised in an era where planning was a good word and not a bad word. And as I understand it from uh, Alain, um, it's really imperative at this stage to have a much better understanding of the uh, demand-driven um, technology issues in order to uh, design appropriate supply-driven technologies. So there's a sequential matter here. And what I was trying to think about is what is the, the best strategy to design such a, uh, um, a modalities that would merge the requirements of demand-driven technologies and supply-driven technologies? And it occurred to me that it requires very different skills. You would require the skills, skills of agricultural economists, rural sociologists, to know much more about uh, the extent to which uh, uh, activities during the uh, uh, season where uh, production is not ongoing uh, uh, between uh, harvesting and uh, planting, what would be appropriate task that could be done. This requires certain skills, economists, sociologists. At the same time, these individuals should be able to also talk to the production agricultural types. So what this calls for would be a team approach. And once, uh, this is something I've never quite understood, the physical sciences and the biological sciences are way ahead of the social sciences in terms of merging different skills within a team to come up with solutions to these problems. So if I have any recommendation here, it would be to see how far one could go in coming up with a, uh, an appropriate strategy to merge uh, these two things. Then a very quick uh, point on uh, Catherine's uh, presentation. Um, w would you agree that there might be some kind of lexicographic ordering when it comes to uh, decisions with regard to agricultural production, that the male essentially has the, the first word? And then the woman, the spouse, as I understand it, who typically manages financial matters, would then, with whatever residual is left over, make decisions. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a question mark. And then the final point is, uh, you didn't say very much about the <coughs> decision-making process between the spouses. And I think it would be very interesting to understand better what is going on. Does a male simply make the decision and imposes it on his uh, uh, spouse? Or, or is it an actual dialogue that leads to a decision? Uh, I think it, it, one needs to understand this in order to perhaps come up with uh, tentative solutions to this uh, issue. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. We'll, we'll take, there's a lot there. Let's take one more question. We'll just stay on this side. There's, we have time to get over to this side in the next round. So take, take one or two more over here. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my question is on Catherine's presentation. Um, Catherine, I just want to ask if we change the context of the experiment to a situation whereby a man has more than two, three, four wives. Do you think we still have the same conclusion from your experiment? Thank you. Okay, one, one more. Let's just go to the, we'll work our way back. Go ahead, Pear. 
Yeah. Thank you very much. Pierre Pim, Slovenis, and Cornell. Uh, I have a question to any of the panel members, and it has to do with the rapidly changing land tenure and the possible impact on uh, technology adoption. Uh, even though the data are somewhat um, shaky still, it's my understanding that in several African countries, absentee land ownership has increased dramatically during the last 10 years. And I'm referring both to um, uh, within country uh, investment and also the international, uh, what I have been referring to as land grabbing, but you can use whatever term you like. Uh, my question is, um, has that change in land ownership or user rights affected adoption of technology and has it affected uh, productivity of uh, land and labor? Okay, let's let's go to the panel. There, we have plenty of time, so we'll get to your questions, but uh, we'll open it up. Who wants to go? Let, let me answer uh, Eric's point. I think this is well taken that uh, we would like to go to a more demand-driven approach. I think any any class you take in BizAd with on the entrepreneurship and design would tell you that this is the starting point. You don't start with what you can do. You start with what your customers want. And the hardest part of a uh, design is precisely to identify what is it that those customers particularly want. And typically the way the approach that is being proposed uh, is, is to organize an interdisciplinary team, including psychologists and others who can uh, probe into what is it that people would like to have. Th this concept of the sort of extreme non-adopters is a useful focus point. That is, there are people whom you think should obviously be adopting what you are offering and yet are not doing so. And so those, those may be kind of your marginal future adopter, provided you would do a kind of marginal change to what you are currently offering in terms of technology. But the, the, the point is that you, you have to be able to maintain a, a di an interdisciplinary dialogue, not only among, among the scientists, but also among the agents, namely the farmers and others, right? So, well, that's why I spent quite a bit of time looking back at what the CGIAR and others have been doing in terms of participatory approaches to, to research. And what you find is that there have been important attempts, but they are usually quite limited. And, and typically they start with the wrong premise, which is that the scientist knows the answer and is going to be able to sort of debug from what the farmers are going to say, which of what the scientists can do is going to be applied. So in the end, it is still, still supply driven from an agenda, you would say, instead of being broadly open, right? What we would want to do is the opposite, to say, let's take an interdisciplinary team. What is the issue? Well, the issue is poverty, right? So the issue is not yield or fertilizer, it's what you could do with the assets that you currently have in order to improve the situation of the, 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 this household, which is basically affected by poverty, which has to be defined, but a, a solution which is to be jointly taken. So I think we are that far. The, the, the question is, institutionally, how do we arrange it? And the CG had been importantly vested into farming systems and, and the CL and participatory research. The reason why it has largely backed out is that it is not cost effective. And so one has gone to sort of the green revolution type approaches where you have economies of scale by, by definition, which leaves sub-Saharan Africa behind. As, as Willis was saying, a lot of heterogeneity, the need for customization, hence the need to tailor solutions to local situations, but there's the issue of cost effectiveness. And that's where I think we are still looking for, well, how to kind of bring the two together. We want more customization, but we also want to be more cost effective than it has been in the past. Maybe on uh, your question, Per, I think uh, there's somebody in the room who's better qualified to answer, uh, referring to Klaus. But my understanding is uh, partly also Klaus's word that many of, so when you get these larger land holdings that in terms of spillover effects for technology adoption, that it hasn't been so big. Uh, there was one recent paper presented also preliminary results for medium-sized farms in Tanzania, so it's not published yet, but they're sort of, they were kind of coming up with some more positive results, uh, sort of, as I was alluding to, that where there are areas with more medium-sized farms, there may be more mechanization, so they may demand, they may have enough land, and then sort of start to do uh, machinery services in addition. Uh, there were also even some, some insights that it may 
actually increase to on the output price that may lead to a higher price for the smallholders because more traders were coming, so there's more volume to be gathered. These are preliminary results. That's why I said I'm taking on the medium-sized firm some space to, to, to watch. But uh, I think, Klaus, uh, maybe you can add to that. I think it's interesting on the demand side, sort of the value chain sort of coming in in a, in a different way, right? So uh, as I concluded in this fifth message for staple crops, there are some opportunities for value chain. And I think it, 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 they're less than for many of the cash crops or, or the or export crops uh, where there's more value added. But supplying the cities, rice, I think, is a very good example where there's clearly a lot more value to be added by uh, providing the right rice uh, for, for domestic consumption. So there, in a way, if it's then it starts from the market. This is what the urban consumer wants. Uh, the distributor needs a rice they can sell. So then the question is, okay, how do I get the mill to procure the rice which I can actually sell? And then the mill, how can I make the farmer grow the rice which I can sell to the distributor and then to the customer? And so there's a huge coordination problem, which is sort of these, these chains are trying to come up and the government sort of trying to help either by supporting elements in the chain. This could be the mill. This could be the distributor through financing, direct financing, or simple coordination, interprofessional organizations, etc. So I think there you, you do get that element of, of a demand-driven, uh, yeah, it's catering to the demand. We need a certain product in a, at a certain volume of a certain quality. Now, if you bring that to millet, bring that to sorghum, to bring that to some other staple crops, it may be less clear than sort of this rise is a bit of a cash and food crop at the same time. Uh, so yeah, I think there is more scope for that. The value chains is potentially one, uh, is sort of naturally in a way addressing that a little bit. So the question I think is then also more for the public sector. What what technologies, where do you invest? Is it is it mechanization? Is that the technology we should? Is that what the farmers want? Uh, what type of crops, etc. So that could yeah be more demand driven, I think. So on the question of uh, how do, do households really make decisions, what is the process of decision making, how it happens, I think there's uh, really a lot to be, uh, to be studied and learned. I think we know very little on exactly how the negotiation goes on. And I think what makes it particularly difficult is also something that we observe in this, in this project is that there's a large heterogeneity. So you cannot say there's one model that apply, you know, the, like the husband would be the first mover and then, you know, it's very hard because there, there are definitely different models out there, even in these very homogeneous con uh, uh, context. And this is also, you know, when we, you talk about polygamy, I think uh, we know, so we already know quite little in, as to how do these nuclear households function, but for polygamous households, <coughs> we know even, even less. One thing is for sure is that even in the case of a polygamous household, I think it would be wrong to look only at the preference of the household head, especially if you, if you study uh, the type of activity that uh, uh, women engage in. Because one thing that characterized from uh, the data uh, we have from Burkina Faso, this type of household, is the fact that women are quite independent in how they will manage their own uh, income generating activity, especially in polygamous uh, union, where they seem to have even more independence. Um, so I think there's actually a lot to be, to be learned about uh, uh, how our preference aggregated and decision taken. Uh, within uh, within households, I don't think we have a, the the right answer yet um, in many developing country contexts. Okay, let's uh, let's take a few more. We'll take a few. Like, go ahead back here in the corner. Uh, thank you. This is uh, a crucial topic. Um, I think that um, in the past there were one or two arguments which have been put forward on why uh, technological modernization in Africa is uh, slow. One is that uh, <clears throat> the R&D institutions, uh, they're dealing with sorghum, millet, cassava, and maize, basically. And these are, ex with the exception of maize, these are crops that are not grown in the West. And uh, the, the Green Revolution, uh, which succeeded uh, with uh, wheat and uh, rice and, uh, and, and, and uh, corn as well, basically were crops that were grown in, in the West. And so, um, I mean, 
I remember that um, one of the arguments was that uh, supply, in your own terms, supply side uh, modernization, uh, research and development, actually are weak because uh, there's not much support by the international organizations. While there was in Mexico and uh, in uh, Southeast Asia and so on and so forth. Now another story, and so is it still true? I mean, is it still viable? Another story was that um, now at the University of Amsterdam, one, one of my PhD worked there three years, and there was this Professor Kaiser who said that uh, Africa is not uh, increasing food production because basically there is ferrous soils. And so Africa has bad soils. And then and water is not like in Bangladesh, 10 meters down under the ground, but uh, 100 meters is very expensive to get. So that is unsuitable. And is it... Um, now, if that is the case, then even a supply-driven modernization becomes very costly. And so the, 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 and then it's not surprising that the farmers won't adopt it. And the third point is that, <coughs> like um, uh, um, Willis mentioned, it, it's an entire stream of, I mean, it's a long chain of problem. I mean, if you have the wrong exchange rate, I mean, uh, and this is what has happened in Africa for 20 or 30 years, people in the cities, particularly in coastal cities, they eat pasta, polenta, uh, and Western food, which are subsidized, they are cheap, and they have a very little time, require very little time in processing. Now, so, so now that is not what you've been discussing, but um, again, I mean, that, that uh, perhaps the exchange rate maybe should come in. And finally, to you and the commentator, one, uh, one proposal. It is true there are many factors. Africa is different, is heterogeneous, and so on and so forth. Why methodologically not doing one of these natural experiments? Now, one of the experimental countries could be Ethiopia. Ethiopia has been trying to has increase yields, and it has attacked the problem on, on all fronts. And now I don't know which one is the, the, the bad, the bad, the, the, the other country for the counterfactual. And then uh, you can see which are the factors which are binding the landing, uh, the yields increase. Thank you. Yeah, Jean Philippe. I'm Pekka Jamsen. I would like to ask Ms. Uh, Professor De Janvier, uh, but, uh, because I think he is one of the contributors of the World Development Report of 2008, which talks. Uh, quite favorably about farmers' organizations. Could you say anything about uh, the role of farmers' organizations in, uh, in poverty reduction when thinking of wider from the, from the technological point of view? That's a great short question. Um, yeah, we'll go here to Jean-Philippe, and then we'll go here, and then we'll do a round over. Yeah, just a comment and a question. Uh, uh, the intervention and the presentation by Alain was, in a sense, quite discouraging for me because it reminded me of, uh, you know, the kind of analysis we were making 30 years ago, especially when India pretended to have the magical recipe for developing the agriculture of Africa because it had climatic conditions, especially in semi-arid areas and rain-fed areas that could be helpful for Africa, which ended up in a total failure. And I have the impression that many of the constraints that you have highlighted were those to which, which we concluded uh, were important at that time, at least quite a number of them, especially regarding the, the need for off-farm employment opportunity outside of the peak agricultural season, uh, and also the problem of the specificity of uh, microclimatic uh, conditions in Africa and the need for specificity. But here you are mentioning a concern that seems to me uh, extremely difficult to surmount, you know, this idea that is it cost-effective, you know, you don't have any uh, scale economies. But there is one thing at least I think that hasn't been touched that seems to me to be quite important when I think of uh, the comparator Asian case, if I believe, uh, you know, the kind of approach and analysis and conclusion of people like Hayami and his team, you know, his work on Japan, Philippines, etc., he was essentially saying that many of the coordination problems that you have mentioned were solved by local leaders 
big farmers emerging gradually, then coming to uh, shifting to becoming a middleman, collecting agricultural producing, transmitting input and technical progress, then selling into the cities, etc., which I found always a fa fascinating ladder kind of story. Uh, and that does not happen in Africa, or in very rare circumstances. And here we don't talk even about farmer organizations, it's really uh, endogenous uh, emergence of uh, uh, the private market agents. And uh, why? You know, why is it so difficult in Africa? And also, what is the, uh, the political economy of it behind? You know, because is it possible for business leaders at local level to emerge being unempered by state intervention, state institutions, etc.? So I think this is an aspect that uh, should be kind of addressed too, uh, in, in addition to farmer organization. Okay. So one last question right here. Yes, uh, Jan Lowe from the International Potato Center. Um, uh, for Dr. De and, uh, and Luke, um, you sort of mentioned quickly in passing extension services and maybe the need for new models, but, or is it the need to back to basics? When I travel in China, I'm always amazed at the very wavy line between public and private sector and massive extension services being used from the public side to support value chain development. So you can't have adoption without access. So I'd like to hear your opinions on the returns to public sector extension investment in Africa, where you think it's been successful, and do we need more of just the back to basics? Right, uh, panel. Yeah, I, I don't think it's all doom and gloom. Uh, just that if, if I said uh, maize, for example, Africa by and large has remained self-sufficient in maize and there's in addition to some intra-regional trade. So I think this is a crop where there has been uh, quite a bit of progress, even though there's still a two ton per hectare on average. So, but there has been uh, quite, quite a bit of response. There's also been a supply response in rice, not enough to keep up with the growing demand, but there has been a substantial supply response. So I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I think the point we're tr trying to make here is uh, it's not enough and it's not enough to sort of we draw attention from it, which you sort of start to see slipping maybe a little bit. And I think that's that's one key message. That's sort of, I think, the, uh, a lance point on, on the maybe more emphasis on demand side, side issues. I think if you talk about examples, uh, Ethiopia has been mentioned, Rwanda has also been mentioned. Yeah. I mean, who would have thought that Rwanda would have been, would have managed to double its yields in a period of five to 10 years? And it's a concerted efforts. Ethiopia, that didn't look as the island of fertility either. Uh, I mean, it was the country of hunger and famines. Uh, Ethiopia has dramatically increased its uh, productivity. Yeah, you can debate here and there the numbers, whether it's actually the high, high numbers which are, are, are put up. But clearly, there has a lot of progress being made. Now, Ethiopia is also a country which has invested massively in extension agents. There is, a, there is an extension agent, there are three extension agents per district for the different activities, it's crops and livestock, etc., and natural resource management. So there has been a very concerted effort, and I would argue that still, up to today, it hasn't really been tried. I mean, despite, yes, there has been more attention, etc., but it hasn't really been tried. I think prices are better, so there has been some supply response, but it's simply not enough yet. Uh, and I think in Asia, many more more concerted efforts have been done as well. And that then leaves out sort of the many of the mineral rich countries, uh, especially oil rich countries, which basically their public, expen public spending on, on agriculture is even lower in terms of shares at least. So they're not even trying as much as, as the others. So there's still scope to do more despite the big Challenges, yes, there's more risky, there's more heterogeneity, etc. But I think one can still invest more. And those countries which have, Rwanda and Ethiopia, come to, to mind. But Ghana has made a lot of progress as well. Uh, Burkina. Uh, so there are countries where more has been, more has tried. Or one tries in a different way and yields go up, but then it's not sustainable. Uh, Zambia yields have gone up quite a bit, but it's in a way that's not sustainable. Same with Malawi. Let me start with the point that Andrea was making, that uh, there is a lack of investment in the tropical, 
crops in a sense, and where success has been achieved is more where there was interest on the part of the West to see investment being made in corn and wheat and rice, etc., but not so much in the tropical crops, although SIP has done some important work on sweet potatoes. And, but wh what we see today is that there's a, a divestment of research capacity in the African context. And so we would like to see results, namely technology being adopted, but we don't want to invest in technology generation. And what we see is that what's available it does not correspond to what is needed for technology adoption. So th what we witness is a contradiction which is simply led by what donors and governments are doing. That is, we refuse to invest significantly into, in research, in agricultural research. When we do it, we do it in a way which is not prone to sustaining using the research budgets for research purposes, that what the donors do in using the CGIAR is basically use it to support projects that the donors would like to be, to be developed. The, the attempt to raise the uh, core support to the CGIAR has not been successful, and there is basically a divestment of investing into basic research in the CGIAR system. So what we would like to see, uh, Andrea is absolutely correct here, we would like to see adoption of technologies for the tropical environments, namely the kind of farming systems that we see in Africa. And at the same time, we just refuse to invest in the, uh, what, what it would take to produce the technologies for those environments. Right? On, on the producers' organization, I think it's absolutely key. Small farmers are not going to do it on their own. In the African context, there is quite often a, a sad story of the cooperative movement that has been used for political control more than to, to serve a farmer's needs. So we need really to reinvent what kind of organization would be effective in this particular context. But you look, for example, in India, the, the, the use of self-help group and the, the coalitions of self-help group into larger producers' uh, corporations uh, in order to mediate the relationship between farmers and the markets through the assembly and the contracting at, at a higher scale shows that the, the importance of using collective action in order to reach the market, and this is something which is, Willis can maybe say more about this, but which is still largely to be done in the African context, in part because of the kind of history of what has been happening with the, the cooperative movement. What Jean-Philippe was saying, I think, is quite interesting. That is, why is coordination not happening at the local level, and why is coordination not driven more by, for example, large farmers who can take into their own hands kind of the, the management, including the subcontracting with, with s smaller farmers in order to deliver to supermarkets or to agro-exporters or agro-industries. Right? This is where maybe the issue of property rights that Pierre was mentioning and that Willis ha have been mentioning is quite important, right? The only 5% of the land in Africa today is under kind of complete property rights. Uh, you may not need complete property rights in the Napoleonic sense in order to have security of property rights and to support investment, there are kind of all kinds of forms of secure property rights which are left to be invented that would deliver the kind of security needed for investment purposes. But in order to have the sort of local coordinating leadership that you would like to see happen, what needs to have security of property rights, at least to a sufficient level that you are going to sustain investment, support investment, and, and this is still to a very significant extent missing. Then I think the SIP question about extension is, is also quite good, right? The, the classical models of extension are not cost effective. We can't have extensionists or lead farmers who are going to take the initiative or go talk to every single other farmer. Right? So there are other forms of experimenting with how to deliver extension. Extension after the end of ISNA, in a sense, has been the, 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 the abandoned child in the, uh, in the CG system. There, there has been, extension is also always criticized for what it's doing instead of being encouraged and experimented with and innovated with, with new approaches. Right? What we have been working on, with, especially with ERI in, uh, in India, are two things. One is to use the agents in the value chains as the, ex, as, as the extensions agents. So for example, the, the agro, uh, agro, uh, agro dealers as being the person, why not do extension to the agro-dealers? The agro-dealers have vested interest in seeing that the seeds that are made available are actually going to be bought by the, by the farmers who are their clients, right? So you can actually use the agro-dealers as kind of massive multiplicators of uh, information which is being conveyed to them with, the, the, with, with their particular clients. And the other is, you were mentioning the fact that a lot of the extension work has been to try to use the social networks and to try to place information, identify the seeds. Catherine was starting with this in her presentation. 
maybe what we should do is to reverse the, the, the system to say what we want, you want to do is to create a buzz in the information system, in the social network, that there's something new to be learned from talking to others. And not try to spoon feed from the seed farmers, the farmers to whom you are seeding, planting the information, expecting that they are going to go forward and communicate the information to others, but create a demand for this information. And then the, the farmers will know where to go. Because you go to the large farmers, you go to the, uh, you go to the extension agents, if it is the case, you go to people whom you know you are being informed. But what is key is to create the idea that there's something new, so a change in culture, in a sense, towards innovation, which is going to induce mobilization of the farm community in seeking information, as opposed to waiting for the information to be delivered. And that could be quite more effective. So I kind of agree with you that the extension system has been uh, left behind to a very significant extent to all models that we know Gershon Feder and others have been criticized and do not work and there's a need for, experiment, for experimenting with other ways of doing it. Okay, uh, next round of questions. Let's just start at the, at the back and we'll move the mic forward here and get three or four more questions. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gutu Ayesa from University of Helsinki. My question goes to Katrin. Uh, when you address the intra-household decision-making dynamics, you didn't mention about the size of the household itself, uh, maybe the children. And in fact, to me, it also occurs that even the ages of the children would matter somehow. How do you take uh, care of that, that issue? That is my question. Thank you. Okay. And then the next one here, we have two, two together. Yep, right there. Okay, thank you. My name is Anna Taivama. I have also a question to Catherine regarding the regarding your last question, where you asked that if the, we should insist that the extension that both uh, men and women are are uh, participating extension extension um, in uh, in households, and I think that there is a simple answer here that it's yes. So because. Uh, there is a gender gap in agriculture. FAO and uh, World Bank have uh, estimated that uh, the yields would be 20 to 30 percent higher if the women had uh, the same access to to resources, uh, technology, land, finance, and extension than men. So, uh, my question is that have you look at the women's economic empowerment within household more broadly? Because that all the women's economic uh, power, or not only making decisions on investment, but also how to use income that you get from the invest, have uh, effects on uh, on um, decision making capacity in the family. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm rather glad that our discussant, Dr. Willis, gave us a, a broad overview and highlighted the fact that Africa is a huge and diverse place or area and therefore solutions that work in one place might not work equally in another. I'd like to provide some observations and perhaps you can take interpret those even as questions. One is that production can be increased of land use, can be uh, agricultural land can be increased either by intensification or by expansion of a subsistence agriculture. Now, if you do the latter, it would mean deforestation and degradation of land in large areas. And this can result in adverse environmental impacts. So that's a very serious consideration. So that we should really be concentrating on intensification of agriculture rather than devastation. Um, now, when you consider that, um, if you increase the technology by introducing more efficient and new technology, then you reduce the amount of manpower or in terms of personnel that you need to manage these farms or even uh, small farms, which would mean that you have to find alternative employment for those who are displaced. And these displaced individuals might not be highly trained and therefore they cannot earn enough to become equal to others in our quest for equalizing inequality. So 
the, the, therefore, the labor on the farm would have to be higher quality labor because they would have to run the machines and repair them. And here you need training programs for that purpose, which will take time. Now, coming back to a country I love very much, Tanzania, um, if you increase the area of land in Tanzania, you me it means you will destroy wetlands. And you have to count the, um, the disadvantages and the costs of doing that. Because wetlands are very important. Tanzania is basically an arid country. And wetlands are, wetlands are very important for sustaining wildlife resources. And as you already know, um, wildlife resources and environments provide tremendous uh, revenue from tourism. So if you take away the, the water supply to the wildlife, you will diminish wildlife populations drastically. And this will also be uh, added, added to by the uh, impact of poaching on the wildlife. And therefore, you might find that your increased income from agriculture tremendously diminishes the income from tourism. Secondly, when you intensify the agriculture, you have to consider the impact of pesticides on t intensification and the consequent pollution. And if you pollute water, it's very serious for human supply of water. The other aspect of Tanzania is that about 70% of Tanzania is unfit for rain-fed agriculture, and also because of the presence of tsetse fly, which gives nagana in cattle and uh, sleeping sickness in man. And you can also consider Kenya, where more than 50% of the area is unsuitable for rain-fed agriculture. Now, in Kenya, only recently it was reported that they are trying to afforest an area as large as Costa Rica. Why? Because that air size area has been degraded due to collection of firewood. And there are other repercussions concerning wildlife, concerning climate change, concerning rainfall, water supply, etc., etc. So these are the complications, actually, which arise from just discussing and focusing on intensification of agriculture by technology, expansion of agricultural land use, and things like that. Good. Thank you. Let's go one, one last question right here. <laughs> Ellen Huan Yemi, Natural Resources Institute, Finland. Very short question. I would like to know whether uh, Africa can frog leap to adopt precision agriculture? Thank you. Um, just one thing that uh, I was just thinking that demand driven um, technology adoption and there I was thinking of connecting to your dec household decision for uh, technology adoption. So basically the in agriculture the technologies are very different. Some are it divisible and some are indivisible. Say, for example, the water pumps, which are or tractors, right? So, from demand-driven side, so for some of the technology, say laser technology, which is family adoption ownership that can happen. But for large one, what can happen is that there may be entrepreneurs who are giving the service. So people do not want the technology, the bulk technology to own, but they want the irrigation service. They want the water pumping service. So the service driven entrepreneurs can actually provide the service and not the technology ownership. This has actually happened in many of the states in India where uh, they were late adopter of the technology and they really did not want to participate in the Green Revolution at the beginning. So they went for a service driven uh, technology service provided to others. Okay, thank you. So we only have we only have really a few minutes left, but what I want to do is uh, first ask Willis. Uh, he's been he's been patient as our discussant. So first, if Willis has anything to contribute, there's no way the panelists will be able to respond to all those questions that we'll give a few give them a few last minutes here, but uh, the discussion can continue over coffee and elsewhere. But Willis. Well, thank you very much. I think we benefited a lot from the questions which came from the floor. And uh, opened new areas for, uh, for uh, further work. Um, but I think the issue of uh, incentives also matter. Uh, 
if you give incentives to any individual, be it in Africa or anywhere, they will respond uh, accordingly. So if uh, effective in, uh, incentives are given, be they the small-scale farmers or um, large-scale farmers in Africa, they will uh, uh, respond appropriately, as it were. Then um, I, I need also to say that collective action is very important in, in areas of uh, small-scale farming. Uh, because if you don't, if they don't collect them, I mean, bring themselves together, it is very, it is going to be very expensive or, uh, uh, to give uh, services to them, and in fact, even information. So once the information is there and collective action arrangements can be made, I think that's one area where productivity increases in small-scale farms can be uh, achieved. And uh, lastly, we have to avoid coordination failure. Uh, whatever we do, if there's no lack of coordination, uh, then of course everything will come to zero, as it were. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, panelists, any, anyone dying to give a last 30 second uh, response to those complex questions? Yeah, Catherine, you, you had a few to you. Why don't you, why don't you take the last few seconds? Okay, just uh, very quickly. So, Unfortunately, I think I don't have a, a great answer. So, yes, uh, in many complex households, there, there are many more than two adults. There could be uh, adult children living in the same household, also having some decision-making power. How to integrate, how to you know, make sense of the decision-making process in that case is even more complex. And I think there are very few efforts trying to understand this. Um, there's uh, so on the on this question about decision making in various areas within the same household. I think this is actually a, a great question. We often summarize things by speaking of a, a bargaining power for two people. But if you elicit bargaining power in different sphere, let's say you you get very different answers. And I think we don't again we don't really know how uh, to ag to to aggregate this. Uh, one project we are working on in Cameroon actually suggests that what we sometimes take as a lack of cooperation, like, uh, you know, different people managing their own, their own little sphere, may sometimes be actually some kind of delegation model, which is not necessarily uh, uh, inefficient. Uh, and this is, yes, I think, uh, so this is, again, a, a project that is uh, going on, but I think this, this may offer a new um, view on the way uh, this uh, co complex household may function. And the type of household I've, I've talked about today is, are really nuclear, so it's, it's already quite complicated in, these, in those simple households. Okay, well, with that, uh, if, if, if you have questions, then I feel, I feel your pain because I have 18 questions that I didn't get to ask. But um, we will have time over coffee and elsewhere. Find them. Let's thank them uh, for their presentations and discussions.